Well, thank you, Harley. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of presenting this work. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity of being uh, interacting with the Center for Latin American Studies. I very much admire what the Center does, and I think that the publication that you uh, publish uh, every couple of months, right? Is a, is a major contribution to Latin American studies and to the contributions that Berkeley makes to that subject. So let me address the issue of the Mexican land reform. And I'm going to take a sort of long-term perspective uh, in a kind of Gabriel, Gabriel Garcia Marquez type thing of 100 years of existence and different forms of, uh, of uh, rebirth, and a death that is prematurely foretold in the sense that you will see at the end that there is kind of an optimistic vision that comes out of this analysis, namely that the, the Erido, in spite of everything and in spite of the expectations that it would disappear as an institution, is in fact relatively alive and well. And I will finish by sort of discussing what can we expect to see happening. So this work is actually done with Elizabeth Sadure, who is here, with the Marcos Gonzalez Navarro, who is at the University of Toronto who is our important uh, Mexican uh, co-author and uh, has been very instrumental in uh, helping us get access to the right information. So I'm going to give you a sort of storyline, uh, which is going to lead me at the end to some propositions as to where does the Ejido stand after such a long time of, of successive reforms. I start from the angle of theory, and the angle of theory is one where we look at the issue of property rights, we look at the issue of kind of letting the market or using the government to allocate land towards the optimum farm size and using access to land as an instrument to reduce poverty. And we have a very strong kind of theoretical anchor available to us with very distinguished uh, references. There's the Chicago School of Property Rights. There's the recent book of uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, Why Do Nations Fail? that very importantly places the issue of inclusive institutions and property rights, kind of distributed property rights, as a key anchor to, what, to sustainable development. And yet when we look at reality, we see that the way property rights are assigned and the way land is distributed is far removed from what theory is suggesting could be done with proper property rights and a proper distribution of the land. We see in Africa, most of the land is in open access. We see, as Elina Ostrom has shown us, a lot of common property resources which are not used in a sort of cooperative fashion and hence are used more like an open access resource than a productive resource. We see a lot of land which is informally occupied. In Brazil, many farmers are just sitting on land that has been squatted upon. And so, and then we see land very unequally distributed between sort of the, the old latifundio, minifundio, but kind of a, a sort of bipolar distribution where most of the land is with large farms and most of the people, most of the farmers are, are on, on small uh, amounts of land. And then in terms of poverty, we see that land is actually not used to its potential because of world poverty. We know that like 75% is actually people who are in the rural sector, who, people who make use of the land, and people who tend to be poor because they don't have sufficient access to the land. So let me call this the puzzle of land reform. That is, there is sort of a disconnect between what theory is telling us and what history is showing us can be done with land and property rights, and the reality of the way land is used. So the puzzle, in a sense, is going to be to try to reconcile this gap between what theory is telling us and, and the reality. Right? So the. The puzzle of land reform is basically because land, to do land reform, to redistribute land, is something which is very hard to do. Right? It's very hard to do because typically the landed elites are the ones who control the state. That even though theory tells us that land can be efficiently distributed, and hence we could have what economists like me call Pareto optimality after compensation, namely what you could do is tax enough of the gains of the gainers to compensate the losses that people who have been expropriated are going to incur. Right? Reality is that land, land reform is very hard to do, and that most of the land reforms that have been done have been done under either foreign powers, like what happened in Japan or in Italy, southern Italy, what happened in Taiwan and South Korea, or has been done under military power. For example, the work of uh, Michael Albert, Albertus at Stanford looked at land reforms in Latin America following the Alliance for Progress. Well, 
like eleven of the nine befores were done under military regimes with examples of Peru and Venezuela, etc., dominating the, 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 the situation. The problem is that once so land reform is hard to do, autocratic regimes are the ones that can sort of oppose and expropriate the elites and use the land reform as a way of establishing power, a way of counteracting revolutionary pressures, ways of undermining a potential return of the elites, and ways of establishing a kind of clientelistic mechanism whereby votes are going to be controlled out of the beneficiaries of the land reform. So the reason, so land reform requires auto autocratic regimes, but autocratic regimes are going to do types of land reform which are for their own purposes, which is basically for political control and for clientelism. And as a result, typically, the way property rights are going to be assigned is going to be what we call incomplete. And the reason why property rights are incomplete is not a kind of policy mistake. It's just that incomplete property rights is the way by which political power can be exercised. And an autocratic land reform, which has the, the purpose of estab establishing political control, is going to use incomplete property rights as the instrument of expropriation. So take the example of the Mexican land reform, revolution of 1910, one million people dead. The desire, in a sense, to kind of stabilize the, the revolutionary pressures, to expropriate the elites, to establish pre-control over the political process, and hence get a massive expropriation of the hacienda, the creation of 32,000 ejido communities, which are agrarian communities, which are entrusted what usually were previously haciendas, which are then distributed to a group of members which are going to receive a plot of land in usufruct, which are going to receive large expenses of land, which tend to be in pastures and forests, which are going to be kept in common property resources. At the end of the land reform that went on from 1917 to 1992, 3.5 million households were benefited by being given access to land about 52-54% of the Mexican territory of arable land in Mexico was in the Ejido sector. And what you have here is about kind of three and a half million households, which is probably between 13 and 15 million people who have been granted access to land under this form of land reform. Now, the property rights that were thus established were highly incomplete. They were highly incomplete because the plot of land was in user for it, meaning that you had the right to use, but you didn't have the right to decide how to use it. For example, you didn't have the right to not use it. If you would not use the land, you could be expropriated. So it was a sort of use it or lose it proposition. A, an ejidatario that did not use the land could be expelled and replaced by someone on a long list of so-called ejidatarios in waiting by a commission that was a kind of a state commission that hence was sort of remove from political pressures from within the ejido and would implement the uh, land reform legisla legislation. Um, the ejidatarios didn't have the right to rent, did not have the right to work the land using hired labor, didn't have the right to <coughs> leave the land fallow for a certain period of time to, for example, migrate to the city or migrate to the, to the United States. So a very highly controlled uh, set of prop very highly controlled access to the land with what we can call very complete property rights. The common property resources, uh, the, the uh, pastures and the forest, were basically uh, under the authority of the assembly and uh, again here with very weakly defined property rights, a lot of encroachment from people from outside the, the Ejido. And the lack of management and the lack of cooperation in the use of those resources would kind of push the extraction from those resources to the margin very much like would be done with, with an open access resource. And then finally, the assembly that had to meet periodically and had to have a quorum and that who had to collect votes at least once a year was very heavily loaded with government representatives. And those government representatives were quite important in sort of mediating the relationship between the ejidatarios and the market, the ejidatarios and the public good. And the fact that they were incomplete property rights, meaning that by lack of having 
property rights. You could not access, for example, credit. You could not take insurance contracts directly. All of this was being mediated by the assembly, and all of this was being mediated by the relationship with the state. And so it is this incomplete property rights which, in a sense, gave the government a handle over the ERIDO and was able, in so doing, to control the vote that the ERIDO would deliver to the PRI, to the dominant political party. So the vote was basically delivered by party bosses that kind of manage the mobilization and the information around the electoral process. There's something which is very interesting, is that because the ERIDO is a, is a geographical unit, the uh, electoral section quite often is coincident with an ERIDO, meaning that there is no secret vote. They said all you have to do is to read the votes in the corresponding section, and you would know how the, the, the ERIDO voted, right? So this lack of transparency, in a sense, was a very powerful mechanism of, of political control, which also sort of plays against your best constituency, because instead of needing to buy the vote via public goods, what you could do, in a sense, is buy the vote by, by punish, punishing for failing to deliver the vote. And hence, as a consequence, you needed to as assign not more but less public goods to the eridos, because instead of needing, needing to create incentives, you could use coercion as a way to mobilize the vote. So this is what I call the curse of visible clientelism. Namely, it's not that you become a sort of favorite core constituency and you benefit from more allocation of public goods. It's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. So what were the consequences of this autocratic and incomplete form of land reform? Well, on the one hand, land, redistri land redistribution was politically motivated. So what you can do is track the timing of the redistribution to first the electoral cycle and second to the uh, political uh, tensions that they are prevailing in a particular region of the country. And you would use redistribution as a way of kind of con so controlling for those uh, social movements and uh, as a consequence using very explicitly the process of expropriation as a way of mobilizing political votes. Second, what we see is that the pre-share of the vote was directly related, very much influenced by the amount of land that had been redistributed in the pre-electoral period. And third, what we see is that, in fact, this form of land redistribution was actually quite detrimental to growth. If one looks at state-level growth, what one finds is that the amount of land redistributed has a negative impact on the corresponding growth performance of the state. And then taking this to the municipal level, a rather famous paper that came out recently by Melissa Dell, a student from MIT, we, who looked at the following causalities, where in municipalities that were more exposed to droughts in the, at the turn of the century, more insurgency leading to more expropriations, leading to hence more eridos. And what we see today is that those areas that have more eridos, as a sort of long-term consequence of exogenous events, of events that happen as a consequence of, of droughts, weather events, those municipalities have a lower performance in terms of incomes, in terms of the sources of income coming from agriculture versus industry. They are more agricultural than they are industrial. And finally, it also reflects on the sort of political conditions, and we see less alternations in power uh, at the uh, mayor level in terms of political parties. So what we see is the long pool of history going to 1992 of a very powerful, extensive, so probably at a world scale, one of the most extensive land reforms, but that created, that was used as an instrument of political control, and that had rather disastrous consequences in terms of economic performance for the regions and the beneficiaries of the reform. So this is when Salinas came, uh, introduced in 1992, a reform of the Constitution to basically allow to improve this, those incomplete property rights to transform usufruct into certificates, where certificates of ownership could be traded within the community, could allow you to rent your land to somebody else, could allow you to leave the land fallow, idle, if you wanted to migrate, and could allow you to use the land with higher labor instead of having to use it yourself and, and with your family. So basically, pushed by the 
entry into NAFTA in 1994, pushed by membership into the OECD, facing a situation of agricultural stagnation and extensive rural poverty, the pressure for reforms, and Salinas introduces in 1992 what is called Procede. Procede is a process of certification of the land in the Ejidos. The, uh, so this program was rolled out between 1993 and 2006, and this is what we used as an empirical identification strategy, namely that the ejidos were gradually brought into procede, and so we always have a counterfactual, which is some ejidos are into procedes, others are not into procedes, and the ones that are not yet into procede give us the counterfactual to measure the impact that those reforms are going to have. So let me show you the process of land reform. It starts in 1993 with just a few points, and then 94, you see those, those the, the dark points are all the, the lands which are gradually being titled 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2003, 2004, 2005, and it finishes in 2006. And this is just massive. It's very rapid. It's done in about 15 years. It's done in a very legal, legally controlled uh, way with a procurador with kind of the right to recourse a kind of mobilization of the Ejido in a sort of participatory fashion for all neighbors to agree on the way in which the land was going to be assigned to the former uh, members of, of the Ejido. So we take this to the data and we ask ourselves, what are the consequences of this process of certification? And we take the analysis into three dimensions. First, we ask ourselves, well, what are the political implications? Who won politically from granting this granting the land to three and a half million uh, farmers. Right? A massive asset transfer in a sense. Right? There's probably nowhere where you have had such a, a huge asset transfer. And obviously it has to have important consequences. And the, we, the, the dimensions of analysis that we studied here were one political, two in terms of labor and migration, and third in terms of land use. Right? So first in terms of, my, of, a, of political implication, what we see here is that the Ejidos, this, so this is the vote for the pan. This is an Ejido in this 1994. So those, those are the elections for the uh, Federal Congress elections which happened in the last three years. So this is how the Ejidos that were certified vote. This is the Ejidos that are not yet certified. Three years after, those Ejidos have become certified. This, and what you see is the increase in pan vote, which is associated with the increase in certification. The Ejidos, which are not certified, vote with a lesser percentage of voices going to the pan. When they become certified, you see the increase in vote on this end and here. So what we see is that there was about a 7% uh, increase in vote for the pan as a consequence of, of proceeding. And as you know, the PRI lost the election to the pan, right? And so what, the, what we see here is that, so, we can further look into heterogeneity, vested interest theory, we see stronger electoral shifts in Ejidos that are closer to the city. Obviously, the closer the land is to the city, the more interesting it is to acquire a, a property title because you are going to eventually sell it for construction, and this, can, this is a, ma a major uh, rent that you are going to, to capture. With better land quality, it's more attractive to have a title over a land that has more productive potential than not. With lower without feeling bound to the party that actually was at the source of the transfer that benefited to you. And in this case, the Ejidatarios becoming property, kind of petty bourgeois, if you like, right, voted very conservative, are more interested in a pan-pro-market party than they are interested in a pro-state uh, political party, because from now on, what they want is kind of security of property rights, and they want a favorable market environment where they're going to be able to value the uh, Result, the assets that they have received. Right? So you can, we can ask ourselves, well, why, why did the PRI do this? The PRI shot itself in the foot, in a sense, by giving out titles and not being able to capitalize in terms of reciprocity, in terms of vote, from the transfer that has been made. Right? What happened is that Salinas wanted to do at the same time an economic reform procede as pushed by NAFTA and the OECD membership, but at the same time wanted to reform the PRI and make the PRI into a much more modern and market-oriented party. At the same, 
But then came the midterm elections. The Olga of the Pre in 1991 won the elections. Colosio, that was to be the implementer of the pre reforms following on the initiatives of Salinas, was assassinated. And as a consequence, what you see is that this sort of joint modernization that Salinas had planned to modernize the Ejido with the tightening of Procede, but to modernize the party into a pro-market party that would be attractive to the beneficiaries of the land title, this correspondence was lost. The PRI remained a kind of non, less market-oriented party than the PAN. Procede went ahead. Beneficiaries were titled. They wanted a more market-oriented party, and the PRI was not able to deliver. The second dimension of the impact that we study is on labor and migration. <clears throat> now, that's quite interesting that what the, the usufruct rights that the pre-reform hereditarios had basically tied them to the land, did not give them the flexibility to work, have the land work by somebody else to seize labor market opportunities, either in the, in the area working off farm or to migrate to the United States or to, to the capital city. Right? So once you free this, uh, those labor obligations, you sort of delink property rights from, la from land use. Right? Before, the property rights were established through land use and through the constraint that land had to be used. Had, land had to be used to a kind of minimum level of productivity, usually extensive corn. But that meant that you were applying to the land more labor than you would otherwise want, because if you would not apply enough labor to the land, you are going to lose the property rights, that you, the usufruct right that you had over this land. Right? So what we see is that by deleting, we see a very large impact on migration, that there is a 30% increase in the probability that an Ejido household would have a migrant after tightening. And we see that the decline in the uh, um, there's a 4% additional decline in the population in the localities as a consequence of the implementation of, uh, of Procede. So Procede becomes an important contributor, in a sense, to migration. There's more migration where previously weaker property rights, that is, you had to be on the land to protect your land, where there are better farm opportunities, clearly making it more appealing to leave the farm and to migrate uh, and work outside. And finally, where the lower land quality or smaller holdings that you had to work in spite of yourself and that now you are all too happy to abandon. Right? At the same time, what we see is that in the areas where land is good, where farmers have larger plots of land, then the opposite is going to happen. Those farmers are eventually going to not only stay as opposed to migrating like the others do, but they are going to consolidate the lands of the farmers who go. So what we see and this is the third dimension of our, our, our analysis, what happened in terms of land use, but what we see is a consolidation of land into somewhat larger farms than they were before. Right? So here we look at third dimension, what is the impact on land use. Right? So how do we establish the standard as to how should Ejido land be used? Well, now Ejido land is becoming similar to private land because it's used as determined as decided upon by the owner of the certificate. Right? So what we do is we look at the private sector, which is half of Mexico, and we predict based on the characteristics of the land, the land quality, the distance to the city, etc. how should the land be used according to private sector criteria. And then we apply this predictive equation, if you like, to Ejido land, and what we see is that, in fact, with the certification, land is converging towards private sector use, which for us means that the efficiency gains. Namely, land was quite inefficiently used. Labor was excessively applied to land. Labor should be leaving the land to be better allocated to than working rather poor and very small plots of land. And what we see is a convergence in the, in the Rido of the patterns of land use towards the way the private sector is using the land. So let me finish with an epilogue as to, well, how do we assess this? The first interesting observation is that we look at labor productivity. Now, Harley did a very interesting paper on labor productivity and NAFTA, and it's not because labor productivity increases that 
welfare and wages are going to rise. Yeah? So here, the observation is quite striking. 1994, 1995, this is NAFTA and this is Procede, right? Before, what you see is basically a zero growth in labor productivity, and after that, you see 2.3% per year, right? Question is, what does it do to, to labor? What, what does it do to, well, the Ejido is a residual claimant, namely, those are people who are self-employed, who are small entrepreneurs, so they are, they have a claim on profit. They are not working as wage workers. They are working at home. And so if labor productivity increases, it's their labor productivity. And in principle, by being self-employed, if labor productivity rises, it's more money in the cash register uh, without having to question the, what Harley did for the industrial sector, namely whether there's a link between wage and, and labor productivity. So one can, in a sense, look at this rather favorably to think that there was too much labor stuck on the land because of incomplete property rights. Property rights free labor from doing what is best for itself, including leaving the land, migrating, and seeking employment elsewhere. The better farmers, the better regions consolidate the land into somewhat larger farms, and labor productivity increases. Right? So what's the conclusion? Right? And looking forward, and this is kind of my 100 years of existence and a death prematurely foretold. Right? Remember that when the procedure was introduced, so procedure, let me tell you the end of the story, that the procedure gives you a certificate. This certificate establishes the boundaries of the, of the plot, allows you to rent, allows you to use the plot as you see fit, but only allows you to sell to somebody else in, from the community and not to someone outside. Right? The next step is what is called Dominio Pleno. Dominio Pleno is a full title. It has to be approved by two-thirds of the community. And it can be sold for construction. It can be sold to anyone outside of the community. Right? Now, the first observation of Procede is that this was a huge asset transfer. You saw the map of Mexico being darkened as more certificates were, were being given out. This is probably a unique asset transfer in, in the history of a nation. Right? Now, quite often when you give money to poor people, poor people have a hard time to keep the money, right? When, for example, a dam displaces people and you compensate them with cash, what you find is a few years after, the cash is gone, right? And people are getting sort of in, in destitution in spite of being well off for some time, right? Here, the asset transfer was, in a sense, sort of successfully done in the sense that it was under the form of productive assets to people who knew how to use the productive assets, who had used them before, placing them in a better condition than they were before to make more efficient use of the land. Right? So that's kind of a rather remarkable thing from people like us who are sort of in, in the development business. We would, we would always like to see cash transfers or asset transfers, but it's so difficult to do in a way that helps people better their situation. Well, here there was an asset transfer that actually was quite effectively done. Right? The second is when we look at Dominio Pleno, many of the ejidos had fallen into cities, right? They were already peri-urban. Peri they were ready for Dominio Pleno. They were ready for kind of re, uh, re, re to, to, to become urban uh, construction, construction. And what you see, there were 10% of the ejidatarios requested Dominio Pleno and, and sold out. But 90% remained in, with the certificate. So, what, so the, the second point is this, or the third point is this incredible resilience of the community. The community, as opposed to what was expected with the certification of the, of the Ejido, did not disappear, did not disappear, is remaining in place. And that basically tells us that there is something about the community, that it offers capacity to compete, it offers the ability to govern, it offers the ability to manage the environment, uh, and it offers the ability to socialize and to, to kind of define a, a, a context to which people attribute value and that they are interested in, in protecting. The big challenge now is in a sense what is going to happen. Okay, clearly, can there, there will be modernization, there is going to be diversification. Can there be modernization and, and diversification at the same time as there is going to be community preservation? Some are going to fail. Expectedly, the fact that there is resilience of the community indicates that there is sort of life in the community which is being valued by community members that can be an asset towards modernization and towards diversification. So 
this is the story in a sense. It's the story which is incomplete. What we have seen is the transformation of the Erido over 100 years, and we see that there is still life in the Erido. Some 10% has been kind of going of the Eridatarios have been moving away from the Erido, but we still have 90% which are within, and we see that there is in a sense the capacity to sort of manage the assets which, are being, being trans which have been transferred. Whether those assets are going to be used productively or not, to a very significant extent, depends on national policies. How well is agriculture going to be doing? How much decentralization is going to happen to allow Eridatarios to engage into off-farm activities at the same time as they remain members of the Erido community? And that's this sort of national policy towards growth and towards decentralization. So let me leave it at this. And if you want to ask some questions, I'd be very pleased to, answer, to try to answer. Those are two good points. But the first one is, at the world scale, when you look at successful family farming, there's always a very high component of off-farm income, non-farm remittances, whatever it's going to be. Right? But typically, if you go to Europe, you go to Italy, you go to France, you go to Portugal, what you see is that source of income mean that agriculture, maybe 30 40% of the total, but very importantly, is what comes as a complement. Right? So here, what we see is, is, is this happening, in the sense that the, the Erido remains as a community. There is access to land, which is sort of a, a safety net of some type. It's also food security. Basically, one or two hectares of land, you produce one ton of corn per hectare of land. One ton is more or less what a family of four or five needs per year. Right? So you have your kind of basic food security, which is, which is satisfied. At the same time, the, the wealth, really, the moving forward, in a sense, in terms of income, to a very significant extent, is going to come from what is being earned outside. Right? You're saying that you're, you need kind of large scale. Well, first, the Erido can do scale, because you, you have a, it's like a producer's organization. right? So they, they can, the scale is not so much in production as it is in marketing, it's in contracting, in contracting with supermarkets, in contracting with agro-exporters or agro-industries. Right? The Erido is well placed to coordinate, in a sense, and to eventually contract as a community with a supermarket to sort of guarantee that all those little plots of land in working together are able to satisfy effective demand. So number one, what we see you know, increasingly on the supermarkets here, which is very satisfactory because of what NAFTA has done, is kind of high value crops that are produced in Mexico, which come on the, in the, on the United States market. Can the Erido, Erido Tarios, can the Erido participate to this? Yes, it can. Now, there are two ways in which it can do it. One is just it rents out to a an entrepreneur, and the Eridatarios become workers on their own land, but the entrepreneur becomes the one that kind of manages the technology and manages the contracting out with the supermarkets and the exporters. Right? The other is that the Erido, as a form of governance, is able to manage and coordinate. Right? And when we look, so it's a fascinating thing. We have kind of next door in Mexico 32,000 units of governance that are a fantastic laboratory to understand how 
communities manage their affairs, right, in terms of modernization, in terms of markets, in terms of lobbying and, and public goods and, and, and the role of the, mm -hmm. kind of the, what you can achieve with the vote and the role of the state, right? So some will fail, some will succeed, but in a sense, there is, with complementary sources of income diversification and with high value crops and the possibility of coordination, quite a few should be able to succeed, right? And quite a few do, right? If you, if you look, for example, at the Jacobs Farms, which place organic goods on the uh, Safeway, right, on the, on the different supermarkets in this country, this, those are coalitions of eridos, right, that are producing those organic produce. But I Go ahead, Jerry. I have a question on yeah. the other side, which you did yeah. mention, is, is what has been, um, what's been the Mexican government's policy with regard to on agricultural subsidies, because in the case of Europe, there is one set of policies which are supported yeah. small farmers. In the case of the United States, which is another set of policies which are not really supported small farmers. Yeah, so there are two, the two kinds of subsidies. There are subsidies to uh, larger farmers, another form of mechanization, and things of that type, right? But there's also Procampo that is still there, right? Procampo was introduced in 1994 to compensate, the, to compensate farmers for the drop in prices of the staple goods that, uh, as a consequence of the uh, entry of produce of goods from commodities from the from the United States, right? And Procampo basically is a decoupled form of payment, which is not linked to production; it's linked to area, area which is planted in initially in the crops that were threatened by NAFTA, but which by now has in, is including forestry, for example. So this kind of a green pro-campo that is coming about as a consequence. So Mexican agriculture is quite heavily subsidized in a sense. The, the, so some of the subsidies are very regressive because they go to essentially large farmers. But the pro-campo is a very highly progressive form of, of cash transfers, basically because it is not related to production. So the larger farmers that may have higher yields, as you suggest, and small farmers, so small farmers that don't even sell anything on the market, qualify for Procampo because it's the area and not what you do with the land and what you sell on the market. Right? So yes, having they subsidized, some are regressive and others are, are not so regressive. Right? Yeah, thank you. A wonderful presentation. Uh, I am um, thinking about the question of how would you link NAFTA, the HEDO, and the large uh, Mexican migration to the well, Are there any connections? Yeah. Or, because it seems to be that at the time there was a bulge of migration happening to the U.S. after NAFTA, there had been a lot of uh, talk about that. And so I'm just wondering what right. would be your interpretation for that large migration? So there was a lot of migration that came from the procedure, from the change in property rights, right? And yet, but that is a sort of one-time thing, right? That the land was labor was tied to the land. And labor now is free to do what it likes to do, right? Farming or not, right? So where there's good land, where there's the opportunity for access to markets, maybe more people will stay in agriculture. Re reality is that the uh, ejido, as it was constituted, had as a purpose to kind of freeze the revolutionary power of the Mexican peasantry. And people were placed on land that was you know, eventually very unproductive, very removed from infrastructure on very small plots of land. So quite clearly, once you unlock the right to move away from this without losing your, your property right, a lot of people take this opportunity. And clearly, Procede contributed importantly to migration, right? I think that the NAFTA, and Harley may, may know more on this, but the clearly was the first phase where NAFTA was very detrimental to Mexican agriculture because a lot of, I mean, in Mexic Mexican agriculture is basically corn, right? Uh, especially smallholder agriculture is corn and corn and corn, right? That's, that's what's being done. And then this corn on one or two hectares of land is not competitive with corn, which is produced here on 500 hectares or, or so, right? So in the first phase, and this is where Procampo kicked in to try to protect those smallholder farmers from being kind of bankrupted and pushed out of agriculture as a consequence of the decline in the price of corn, right? The comparative advantage that Mexican agriculture has is high value crops, right? The avocados and the other crops that you now increasingly see on the tomatoes when the 
lobbies from Florida allow Mexican tomatoes to, to come onto the, uh, the U.S. market. So those are the high-value high crops. So there are many ejidos that have irrigation, that have actually good land, that are able to move into those, those high-value crops. So here again, we are going to see differentiation. I think that where there will be less opportunities for high-value crops and contracting in agriculture, for those communities to stay alive the way they currently are, you need access to off-farm sources of income, which could be tourism, which could be you know, drugs is certainly a very important opportunity that many ridos have gotten into very, very, very actively. Right? But the key, in a sense, so I would not kind of dismiss the, the possibility. I think the possibilities are quite, a, quite uneven, and the possibilities are both on the side of the high-value crops. The subsidies are, are still there. And then, very importantly, the off-farm source of income in the areas which are not too far removed from kind of decentralized centers of, of, of uh, in industrialization and, and agro-processing. Right? To what degree are some of the uh, wetbacks re retiring back to an ejido in Mexico when they, re when they get to be the age of retirement? Yeah, most people uh, actually I mean, this issue of retirement is very interesting because, in a sense, this wealth transfer is pensions for the elderly heroes, right? Either when they sell. So one very interesting research question is what happened to people who sold out? Right? Well, I said that for 90%, the asset transfer has been kind of very successful because it's people who used assets before have the assets for themselves now but continue to use the assets. But for example, when people get to a certain age, they can rent out to, to a young person, and then they cash a, an annual pension, in a sense, which is the rent that this younger ejidatarios is paying them for cultivating the land that belongs to them. Right? So in the, it's quite, really quite interesting to see, in a sense, how this asset transfer effectively created a pension system to allow renewal of generations of the ejido and to allow the older people to kind of move away from having to cultivate the fields themselves because now they could, they could rent it to, to somebody else. The other question which is interesting and on which I don't think anybody has yet looked into it is people who cashed, cashed in via the dominio pleno, what did they do with the cash, right? Which is a significant amount of money. Was it invested in a small business? Was it used for construction? Was it used to educate the grandchildren, like say the pensions in South Africa? Or was it simply hard to keep the cash? And then five years after, what we see is that you know, people are not, not well off at all. Right? It's hard to do because it's hard to trace, track those people. We know where they are until they cash out, right? until they take the dominio pleno. Right? After this, it's, it's hard. So we need to kind of develop a system to obtain phone numbers and whatever to be able to kind of track those people as to wherever they went to be able to monitor how well they have been doing with the cash that they have been obtaining as a consequence of the sale. How did the Aquino model think about dealing with population pressure? If you couldn't have yeah. um, inheritance from, to more than one heir, yeah, right. would you have had out-migration anyway? So there was a situation where the Mexican Revolution was in a sense that uh, there had been massive expropriation of land by the haciendas or whatever. So the population had been cornered into less and less land, population growth, kind of declining area of land per, per capita, hunger and poverty and revolutionary pressure. And so what Cardenas and others tried to do was to sort of give access to the land but prevent increasing renewed fragmentation of the land by prohibiting inheritance to more than one heir, uh, right. which created, in a sense, a very difficult situation because the other family members either had to migrate, but usually they would, they would remain around, right? So they were people who were in the ejido without the ejidatario status and without formal access to land. The ejido father, Usually, father, there were a few ejido mothers, but they were, they were like, like 5 or 10 percent only, were prohibited to, to, to uh, divide the land to, without formal recognition, give access to land to different mem members of the family. Right? Created this kind of floating population that certainly was an important contributor also to, to migration. Right? In the process of certification, 
the Ejido as a community had the right to decide to incorporate new members. And there was, in a sense, a one-time deforestation in the process of transition to open land to settle many of these non-Ejido members, sons and daughters of the Ejidatarios, who had remained in the community, but who were kind of second-rank citizens, not having formal access to the land, and they now could become, could become members. So instead of dividing the plots of land, which was still which they could do, but which was resisted by the community, the community could allow to open additional plots in the pastures and in the forest, which, were, which are in common property. And so there has been quite a bit of expansion of the Ejido population in the context of that transition to certification. Right? Uh, up to what degree is the uh, is the model of El Ejido uh, yeah. influenced by indigenous communal uh, values or yeah. models, if it is, is the permanent or the potential it has to develop related to the fact that there still are large yeah. percentages of indigenous right. in Latin yeah. America? So there, there are two. There is the Ejido, and then there are the uh, indigenous communities. Right? The indigenous communities are, in a sense, part of the Ejido, but they are managed differently. In the case of the Ejido, each member has a plot of land, which is, was given in usufruct and which subsequently has been certified. In the indigenous community, it's the community that decides on the land allocation. It's not any external authority. And there, is no kind of, there are no fixed property rights, because the community continuously has the authority to redistribute the land to people who leave. The land goes back to the community. Families that expand, new plots of land are being given to the kids who want to remain in, into farming and, and cultivate the land. So the, the, the land reform, the certification, <coughs> certified plots in the Erido, but certified the community at large without getting into the community as to how land was going to be, going to be assigned. Right? The Erido, I think, as a model, did not exist in the Indian indigenous community tradition. Right? It was really more something that came from Spain, and kind of a model of the kind of a bit idealized community, where the community lived together in a, in a place, had little plots of lands that they would each cultivate, and then was sharing vast common property resources that were administered by the, by the assembly. Right? So, so those are two, two separate models, but I don't think that the Ejido comes from the indigenous tradition. Yeah, how are you? I don't know how related this is, but yeah. this all looks great and it looks like it was very like productivity increased. But it's really hard to reconcile with uh, the really pervasive poverty that we still see in the country, especially rural poverty, yeah. which really hasn't decreased in the last I don't know, how many years, thirty years. Right. So that that's an interesting point because there are very mixed signals about poverty the evolution of poverty in Mexico, right? If you take the World Bank data, which are the kind of 125 a day or two dollars a day, right, with TPP adjusted and all these things that you that you know, right, what you see is that there has been a sharp decline in, in poverty in Mexico, right? It went say on the two dollars a day, it went from about 20 percent to four percent a day. Right? If you look at the Coneval data, which is kind of a, a domestic poverty line, which is kind of defined in a much broader fashion, then you don't see any decline in poverty, right? So. We have sort of those two perspectives on the... Now, it's not saying that there's not a lot of poverty in the Erido. Clearly, there's, a, there's quite a lot of, of, of poverty, right? Uh, so there's, you know, there's much to, to be done. There are social programs that... The, the Erido actually mediates access to those social programs, to the school, to have kind of teachers for the primary schools that are located in, in the Erido, access to opportunities, etc., right? But it's not denying the fact that th there's quite a lot of poverty and there's, there's, there's much to be done, right? What I sort of we trace here is that giving property rights was likely a step in the right direction. A lot of the poverty was because people were stuck doing things that they did not want to do, had opportunities which they could do better than they were currently doing, which they could not do without losing access to the land. And access to the land was still an asset that had value 
access, access to the land was also membership in the community, and you did not want to lose your, your right as an Ejidatario, right? So you are kind of forced into a second best situation of having to work land that was not sufficiently productive, just not to lose it when there were, in fact, better opportunities elsewhere. And that's where I think there has been at least a one-time gain that came out of this, uh, th those new rights. Right? Whether this is going to be used to subsequently capitalize and diversify and all of this, I think very much depends on kind of national policy towards agriculture. Uh, now, one can say that, in a sense, the NAFTA with the access to the US market, US and Canadian markets for high value crops, with the Erido, the, those Eridos, not the Eridos that have bad land and that don't have any control of water, but Eridos that are, you know, in, in, in former haciendas or have been heavily capitalized in the first years of creation of the Erido, have a shot, in a sense, at doing better with the assets that they cannot control. Yeah. Ago and painted a pretty grim picture yes. of what's going on with the current government. So, to what degree would you say that these um, current policy changes are, will be immune or victim to, to increasing corruption in the government? And uh, to what extent will your will Ejidos, are there programs to provide Ejidos better access to the market? I think that the Erido is still very poorly understood by, by policy makers. That the Erido, as a community, as a group that can mobilize collective action, has something to offer that could be capitalized upon, right? Uh, whether it's going to be done or not, I think, is, is very much left uh, unanswered at the moment, right? Mexico has more and more NGOs, right? As you know, there was a, a strong separation between church and state in Mexico, and the fact that NGOs were, were not welcome into Mexico until 20, 25 years ago, right? And now what we see is much more kind of grassroots initiatives where assistance can be found, either kind of, of a goodwill type, but also sort of professional services that Eridatarios can call upon in order to help themselves improve and modernize the, the assets that they control, right? So, now, the, the other thing which is very detrimental to Ejido stability is the drug, the issue of drugs, right? Which, where you go to Guerrero in those areas and you see that you know, drugs are very pervasive, that land, the Ejidos are big areas where there's a lot of hidden land and it can be used for legal and illegal uh, activi activities. But, uh, this is a very corrosive, obviously, situation because it brings in, bring in violence and, and, and corruption, right? So I'm not trying to paint, to, to, uh, to brush a picture which is I think, uh, you know, more rosy than, than, than it is. What I'm looking at is sort of this transition in terms of property rights, which I think in the end was in the right direction, hurt the pre in the short term, whether the pre is going to be able to recuperate itself in becoming a more market-oriented, kind of a more modern party than before, and hence can sort of recapture re the uh, vote that the uh, Erido traditionally was delivering to the PRI. In the transition, this, that, that did not work. And the Erido went more toward, for the PAN that it maintained its support to the PRI, right? Um, so, lots of questions that, uh, in looking at the future that uh, I think create quite a bit of uncertainty as to how do we read it, right? Yeah. Then, sort of as you go south, poverty levels tend to rise. Yeah, sure. Education levels tend to actually decline. Right. Are there any major trends that you see with the yeah, education system? Yeah, there's quite. Right. Th that's absolutely the case, right? That uh, many of the Eridos from in, in Michoacan, in Sonora, in those areas of the north are actually on good land that benefited from major infrastructure investments in terms of irrigation. And, they are close to infrastructure, they are close to, to market opportunities, right? So there is a, a part of the Erido which has the opportunity to modernize, right? There are other parts of the Erido which are, you know, infrastructure is missing, uh, the uh, levels of education are very low, public services in support of entrepreneurship uh, are reduced, and so 
there is a clearly quite a lot of dualism, and the sort of the poverty situation in the Erido is much more in sort of the, the the lower half of Mexico, if you like, than the than, than the upper half, right? So um, dealing with this, that part of the Erido is really calling upon types of programs that do not look at the Erido just as a productive sector. It has to be looked at as a social sector. It has to be looked at in terms of health and education. It has to be looked at in terms of kind of creating opportunities for business and, and for investment. Uh, but that comes via kind of collective action, that comes via capacitation, that comes via better health, that comes via opportunities and sort of keeping the kids at school, etc. So what other countries, for example, we work quite a bit with BRAC in Bangladesh, and there is an interesting sort of ultra poor program where you say poverty requires income generation, but for income generation to start, you need the health, you need the education, etc. right? You need the empowerment. You need the collective action, right? Mm -hmm. So the Erido looked at as a productive sector is going to be sufficient for some, but not for all. And if you take this dichotomy that you bring about between north and south, one would see that you need really to look at the Erido as much more than a productive sector in terms of this other part of the country. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you to Yeah, I, I'm not able to answer. You. I did work more on this in Guatemala, so I, I'm afraid I w I'm going to confuse the legislation between the two. In a sense, the, the ejido is organized like a cop, but there's always in the cop the issue of the asset ownership, which is... Uh, right. Here, the ejido has a formal assembly system. It has a system of a you know, committee de vigilancia. It has, it, it has a very elaborate institutional structure, which is a, a form of, of participatory governance. Right? The Ejido has assets, which are all the common property resources. And uh, the other types of assets are the, the, the land for construction and the land for, for those individual plots. Right? The Ejido typically manages many of the public goods, which are in the community, especially in terms of sanitation, in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of uh, the uh, primary schools that, that, that are there, right? So the Ejido acts a bit like a co-op. Now, it does have the cooperative status in the sense of having shares. And you cannot redeem, for example, your, you, you can now <coughs> sell your land to someone who wants to, to take over from you. Something which, for example, is not clear and is what will happen to the common property resources in the case of the Dominio Pleno. The, Cases of Dominio Pleno now, only 7% of the ones that became Dominio Pleno had some kind of common property resources. Right? Co the common property resources were allocated as shares to the members of the Ejido at the time of certification. When a certificate is traded, the share of the common property resources is not traded at the same time. Right? So in principle, it remains with the, com with the community. Right? However, this is an area of legislation which you know, is, has remained relatively vague and how in practice it is going to be implemented, especially in the context of Dominio Pleno, is something which, which is not clear. Right? Well, I think your, your, your question is, is really important in the sense that would it, that it takes the form of cooperative or that it takes the form of a producer's organization or that it takes the form of the Ejido as it currently exists. What is key in a sense is to be able to mobilize collective action in order, for example, to contract, in order to gain access to credit, in order to, in a sense, you have very small plots of land where people are not individually competitive. You go to Holland, you go to France, you go to other places. One of the key to competitiveness of the family farm is membership to, co to cooperatives, right? You would not think of, say, a Dutch family farmer with a tiny amount of land, but usually in two high value crops, without thinking of the cooperative to which this particular family farmer belongs, right? So 
the, the key to the Ejido, and that's where there is a need for a perspective in terms of NGOs and the way that what government could do in terms of the Ejido, is to use the Ejido as a form of collective action that can be used to create economies of scale, create bargaining power in accessing to the market, create access to, to loans and to, and to insurance schemes, not as individuals, but as, as members of a community. Now, those are people who are sort of not be forced into, as Ejido members, into collective action. There are people who now have to recreate sort of bottom up a process of collective action by deciding that they are going to jointly manage their, their affairs to get better deals with the, with the outside of the Ejido. Good, well, thank you, Holly. Thank you.